This One U server combines the best of U.2 2.5 inch NVMe storage, but it also has EDSFF for E1S storage, and inside there are three M.2 slots. And beyond all that storage, we have room for up to 256 cores, 512 threads, and a ton of networking in the back. This is super exciting, so let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and this in front of me is the Gigabyte R183Z95. Now, something you're gonna notice real quick, especially for any of the longtime STH viewers out there, you're gonna notice that number one, we're gonna be doing this review on the new set. Now, the other thing you're probably gonna notice is that we have a giant moving blanket here, and that is for a very simple reason. I am totally freaked out that I'm gonna move this around and I'm gonna like start showing you guys this and then I'm gonna end up gashing this brand new workbench. I'm just totally freaked out about that. So for now, we have a moving blanket. But this server is super cool. It's an AMD Epic powered server and it's a dual socket server. So we get plenty of cores, we get plenty of memory, but the storage configuration and the add-on expansion configuration in this is super cool. And so a quick game plan for today, I'm gonna show you around the outside of the server. Then we're gonna look at the inside of the server and see how it works. I'm gonna show you some of the things that I really like. I'm gonna show you some things that maybe I'm not crazy about, but are still here. And before we get too far in this, I just wanna say a quick thank you to Gigabyte for letting us borrow the server. I also wanna say thank you to AMD for sending us CPUs that we could use in this. And I wanna say thank you to Kyoxia who sent us some E1 S SSDs that we're going to use in this. I picked them up when I was just in Santa Clara, California, going and doing a tour of Levi Stadium. Definitely go check that out if you haven't. I also want to say thank you to the STH YouTube members who helped us buy some of the other bits that we need for the system, like memory and what have you. It takes a village to do these reviews, so if you can help, that would be super appreciated. You can join down below. With that, let's get to the hardware. Okay, so the first thing I wanna show you guys is the front of the server because there's a lot going on here that's different from a lot of the other servers that we see today. The first thing we're gonna start with is all the way over here on the side. And what you'll see here is that we have a USB type A port, but this type A port, which is a very common front panel feature is not on one of the rack years. Instead, it's actually in line with the chassis. I told you guys, we're gonna go into detail on this. That's just a small detail. Next to that, you're gonna see that we have a total of eight U.2 two and a half inch bays. Now, one of the cool things is that if you get one of these bays, uh, you know, you have their trays, you have coolest trays, which is awesome. All you do is you pop in the drive like this, you hear it snap and you're ready to go. Now having eight drives is frankly not that high of density. In a one use server these days, a high density, just all front panel solution would be having something like 12 drives. But the challenge with having 12 drives is it really restricts the airflow back to the CPUs. And so you run into like, limitations on the TDP of the CPUs. You run into things like, you know, how many expansion cards you can have. And you also tend to use flimsier drive trays because they have to be compressed to a smaller footprint. Now we do get eight drives here, but that doesn't mean that we get less density necessarily because there are another six E1S, which is EDSFF drive base on the front of the system. Now, one of the cool things is that this uses E1S, which you can kind of think of as like a, maybe a better version of an M.2 drive and you can like hot swap it and all that kind of stuff. You get that with E1S and that's pretty exciting. Now, when you pull out one of these little drive trays, the first thing you're gonna see is that uh, you get this like blank, which is just this like kind of piece of plastic. And then you get this little tiny part up here and that's the latching mechanism. So if you wanted to go and say install a drive, then what you would do is you would take that little latching mechanism, you take this blank part off, there are two screws, you put the drive, which we have the Kyoxia XD6 here, and you would put that on and now you're ready to go install the drive. So that brings us to one of the weird things about EBSFF. When they were developing the spec, certain large OEM vendors really wanted to make sure that they still had the ability to sell custom drives, you know, like latching mechanisms that they could look cool and like look and match their aesthetic and all that kind of stuff. So instead of having a drive that has the attached latching mechanism, instead what we get is you have this like little tiny latch that you have to screw into each drive. Frankly, that is a total bummer. There's really not that much value in having a different latching mechanism. The industry should have one and it should have been part of the spec but yet here we are because people have to have nice little tiny latching mechanisms. Now, if you're keeping tally, you'll know that we have eight two and a half inch U.2 drive bays, plus we have six E1S EDSFF drive bays, giving us a total of 14 drive bays on the system. Now you might say, you know, who cares about 14 drives? Well, it may only be a little bit more in terms of the actual density. At the same time, 
having the denser drive bays and being able to use like the larger trays and all that kind of stuff gives Gigabyte the ability to have more airflow going through the front portion of the system, and that gives more airflow to the CPUs sitting behind it, which means that even though we have a 1U server, you're going to see in our performance section that we get pretty good performance out of this 1U form factor, even when using higher TDP CPUs. Moving to the back of the system, you're going to see that we have what is a symmetric or an A and B redundant style of system. That means that the power supplies are on either side. We also have our add-in cards for things like NICs and stuff like that. You'll see those on either side. And then below that, the OCP NIC 3.0s are on the bottom side as well. Having this symmetric configuration allows people to build data centers that have, you know, like PDUs on both sides for A and B power, then also run network on both sides. And by doing that, you know, kind of separates your A and B for redundancy, right? And so that's why you tend to see this kind of design. Now we're gonna get to power consumption a little bit later, but in terms of power supplies, we have 1.6 kilowatt light on units. These are pretty nice power supplies and they are plenty for the system. Now the rear IO on the system is kind of interesting. First, we get a mini display port, which is something that typically you see in VGA. So this is a little different. Some people are gonna love that. Some people are not gonna like that because uh, you know things move very, very slowly in data center and VGA is still the standard. You'll also see that we have two USB 3 ports and then we have two one gig Ethernet ports. Now you might ask, why do we have one gig ports on a server like this? The reason is that you're expecting the OCP NIC 3.0 or the expansion cards to be your high speed networking. This is really for like management. So like, let's say you have a hypervisor or something like that. This is like your management one gig NIC and then you run all your data path over higher end NIC. The other thing you're gonna see is that we have an out-of-band management port. This has an A-speed AST2600 inside and that runs our management interface. Of course, with the server, they're using Megarack SPX. And so you get things like HTML5 IKVMs and all that kind of stuff that you'd expect from a server like this. Next, we should get inside the system. Okay, now getting inside the system is super easy. All you do is you push this little tab down and then you pray and then the little latch comes up. Now you can remove the top of the system. And before we get too far this, I just wanna point out that you do get things like a hardware installation guide and stuff like that on the bottom of the cover. It's a nice little touch that we don't see from some of the kind of lower end systems in the market. Okay, so looking at the system, uh, the first thing you're gonna notice is that you have another little cover here. And in a lot of servers, you don't have to remove this cover, but in this one, you actually do uh, in a lot of cases. So. There are four screws that I already removed just because you don't want to see me do that. And uh, we can pull off this cover now. I'm going to lift this up a little bit more so you can see it a little better. But under here, you can see that we have our E1S, so our EDSFF drive bays. And you can see it's a little deeper actually than our your two and a half inch drive bays, which are here. The other feature that you're going to see though that is super important is that there are these eight dual fan modules. Now, these are not hot swappable dual fan modules. Instead, these have little cables and instead of the cables going to the motherboard which would be on the exhaust side of the fan the cables actually run to the u.2 backplane over here so the good side of this is probably better for airflow on the exhaust side of the fans the kind of negative side to it is of course that if you do want to go and replace a fan you probably are going to have to undo four screws remove this front panel and then you can get in and you know, actually remove these little fan connectors. In a future version, I wish that this was a toolless solution. Okay, now behind the fans, the next thing you're gonna see is that we have these two kind of hard plastic covers and these things direct airflow to the CPU heat sinks. But underneath there, there are two really fun little features. Each side or each CPU has a M.2 SSD that sits under here. Now these things honestly are very easy to get to. You do need a tool to be able to, you know, do the screw for the M.2, but pulling off the top, pulling off the you know, covers for the CPU, like heat sink shrouds and stuff like that. Very easy to do. So serviceability on these is fine, especially for a M.2 SSD, which is super reliable anyway. But that's just a cool feature, right? We get our 14 drive bays up front, plus we get two more M.2 bays there. Now I'm just gonna show you guys this so that way we can kind of complete that thought. There's actually one more M.2 slot over here, and that's just another drive bay. So there are 17 SSD like spots here without having to go over here and go to the like add in cards or anything like that to add more SSDs. For a 1U server, that's quite a bit. And it also allows you to have like a boot drive without having to have, you know, one of these drive bays up front as something that you're gonna have to, you know, use for a boot drive, right? Okay, now probably one of the biggest features here is of course the CPU situation. So we get two AMD SP5 sockets, which support AMD Epic Genoa. They support Geno X and Bergamo. Each CPU socket has a total of 12 DDR5 DIMM slots. 
in this generation, you're probably going to be using DDR5 4800. However, we would expect that AMD would follow Intel and you will see a faster DDR5 speeds when we get things like Turin later this year. And here's a really quick look at installing a Bergamo 128 core CPU along with the CPU heatsink. Now, of course, there are different options. Bergamo uses N4C cores, so you get more cores, but not necessarily as much cash per core. Genoa has the just general purpose Zen 4 cores, and then you have the Genoa X, which adds a ton of cash to the mix. But even with the new fifth generation Intel Xeon Scalable Emerald Rapids parts, these still have way more cores than you can get on the Intel side, and there are two sockets. Okay, now behind the CPUs, you're going to see that we have these cabled connections. These are MCIO connectors, and they provide all the PCIe Gen 5 connectivity throughout the system. To me, there are a couple things that are interesting. Like number one, all of the MCIO connectors are on the backside. A lot of times these days we'll see some of those connectors on the front side to be closer to the NVMe drives. But the other thing that these cable connections allow you to do is have super easy to service rear IO and like risers and stuff like that, right? Because you have cable, you don't have those like slots that are it's kind of a pain to like get them seated properly and all that kind of stuff. And so your risers, when you pull them out, they are super easy to go service like this. Now, of course, since we have modern processors, we have so many PCIe lanes for a one U system that these are PCIe Gen 5 by 16 risers you have a full height riser and so you can put like high end things like you know 400 gig NICs and stuff like that in a system like this. The other thing that's worth pointing out though is that the motherboard stops here. It does not stop at the end of the chassis. The reason for that is that well it's a modern motherboard and something that is a challenge in modern motherboards is just PCIe Gen 5 signaling. Now that leads us to a couple things like first that's one of the reasons that we have cabling but on the other hand, when you have things like the rear I.O., now you can just go put those all on cart. So you have your OCP NIC 3.0 and they use the SFF with pull tab. By far the best OCP NIC 3.0 form factor because uh, it's the easiest to service. So that's my opinion. But the other kind of cool thing is that this little card back here has both our A-Speed BMC and it also has an Intel i350 AM2. Now the Intel i350 AM2 is a nice NIC, but it's still a one gig NIC, but it is a you know step above like an Intel i2 1080 or something like that. So it's a nice NIC to actually have in here. Now that we've gotten through the hardware, I think it's time to look at the performance. <laughs> Okay, so talking about the performance of this, it is very dependent on the type of CPUs you use. For example, uh, you could be using a Bergamo CPU and get up to 128 cores. You could be using like a Genoa or Genoa X CPU with like 96 cores. There are also lower core count options, but depending on the type of family that you're putting in here or processor family you're putting in, plus the SKU, it's a pretty wide range. And so what I really wanted to see though was, well, what happens with this little note on the spec? So going down a little bit on the spec page, you're gonna see that there are limits to the CTDP of the CPUs that you put in here. Specifically, if you're running a pretty warm data center at 35 degrees Celsius, well, then you only have a 300 watt CTDP limit. But if you're using OCP NIC 3.0 with a TDP of 21 watts or less, and you're running your data center at 30 degrees Celsius or less, then you can go run a 400 watt TDP CPU in this no problem. Now the data centers that we used to actually test these things in, they tend to run at 24 degrees Celsius plus or minus about a half a degree. Some folks run cooler data centers. A lot of folks now are running a little bit warmer because you get a little bit more efficiency by not having to cool it as much. But something I was interested in was really what is the performance of this versus kind of like a reference AMD Epic, AMD platform and all that kind of stuff. That's a 2U platform. But the real question I had, at least in our data center, was were we going to lose performance based on the CPU if we, you know, had a high-end CPU in the system? You know, were we going to lose performance because it's only a 1U and it's not a 2U chassis? But then there's the question, of course, what is the high-end CPU? Is it Genoa with general purpose high-end, Genoa X, much cash, or is it the Bergamo many cores? And so I thought, well, why don't we just go put all three of them in there? And when we did that, we saw that generally the performance of this system was actually ever so slightly below what you would see in a 2 system during our benchmark runs. But the overall difference tended to be like maybe 1%, 2%, which is like a benchmarking, you know, it's something that usually we would consider just like a margin of error or just a run variation. However, they were consistently lower. The other thing though, is that all of these runs have a warm up beforehand. Then there are 10 runs where we take out the top and bottom quartile to really get to that kind of middle part that we can average for these runs. So, you know, we are actually seeing a pretty wide range or we are getting a lot of load on these systems. And so seeing them consistently a little bit lower 
does kind of tell us that we are losing a little bit of performance, but let me just kind of back up a second, right? If you're losing one or 2% performance by going from 2U to 1U, most people are gonna take that any day because you might lose that one or 2% performance, but you're gonna gain that by the fact that you're gonna get double the density, right? So that's really the benefit of a system like this. Now, in terms of power consumption, I already kind of showed you that we have these 1.6 kilowatt power supplies, but the overall power consumption of the system is nowhere near that really, right? Now, when we tried like lower TDP CPUs, like in the 300 watt-ish range, we were seeing about 800 watts in total system power consumption, which is not too bad, actually. You have to remember that not only do you have the CPUs, but you also have 24 dims, so your five watts of dim or so gives you about 120 watts there. And then you have cooling and all that kind of stuff, SSD. I mean, there's just a lot going on here. So see 800 watts is not actually unreasonable for two 300 watt CPUs. Now, when we went up to a more like, you know, a higher end 400 watt, we did see that, you know, that gives you 800 watts there. The fans have to spin a lot more to be able to push enough air through. And so we did see closer to one kilowatt on our power consumption. Now, of course, there's more room for that. If you wanna go put like super hot PCIe cards or like SSD or something like that in there, you will definitely go well over one kilowatt, but let's just kind of give you an idea of what to expect. And since somebody always asks in the comments, how loud is it? It's loud. Uh, we actually ran this in the data center, so we're not gonna be doing like noise testing in there because there's just tons of little fans spinning. But uh, this is definitely a loud system. There is a reason that we do not have it on on set right now because uh, you wouldn't be able to hear me. Okay, with all of these videos, I like to have a key lesson learned. And so I got a key lesson learned for this one. The first thing is that I have to say that this is a really interesting storage configuration, right? We got 17 total drive bays, three M.2 drive bays. We have six E1S drive bays and then eight two and a half inch drive base. So there is a lot of NVMe storage that you can put into a system like this. And to me, that's kind of crazy because you have all of the storage, plus you have three different types of CPUs currently that you can put in there. And, uh, you know, not only types of CPUs, those are families, so then there's SKUs inside of that, right? And then in the back, you have a ton of I.O. You could easily have two OCP NIC 3.0s, two expansion cards, and so you could have a ton of networking on the back of this as well, all in a 1U platform. It is just absolutely crazy to me when we think back to, like, the Xeon E5 V1s and stuff like that, when we were reviewing those when they first came out, like, just to see how much bigger and how much denser the systems are. Even over something like if you were ahead of like a 2017 era Skylake Xeon or something like that, first gen Intel Xeon scalable. I mean, this thing is so much denser that it's just kind of almost mind blowing. Hey guys, I hope you like this look at the Gigabyte R183 Z95. This is a really cool AMD Epic system and uh, hopefully you like looking around. If you have other thoughts, uh, especially on the new set and all that kind of stuff, feel free to go put those in comments down below. If you did like this review, well, why don't you go share it with your friends and colleagues and also give it a like, click subscribe and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.